like I said, um, we, we will be sending over the recording of both um, the first webinar and this webinar as well. So if you know um, people that you know would have wanted to come today or just so happen to be in the pub a little bit earlier for the England match, that's absolutely fine. We can send you across a copy of that as well. Um, you'll notice that I'm actually in my boss's office because he's not in for some reasons. I can't fathom why. So um, brilliant. Um, I think... We'll give it another 30 seconds or so, and then we'll get started, Peter, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. We're just letting a couple of people in now. Is England fair. still in? Sorry, Theo. Is England still in? <laughs> <laughs> only just, only just. Not sure how long for, but um, only just. So, um, yeah. Who are, you, who are you playing tonight? today? Denmark. Ah, okay. Denmark. And we've never beaten Denmark, so um, be interesting. We interesting. have done that several times in multiple wars. <laughs> you know, Denmark and Sweden are the two countries that have been at war for many, most years, so to say, in history. Wow, okay. Uh, so I, I'm not sure we have a peace settlement, really, but oh, we keep, we're keeping things calm enough. Oh, wonderful. I just want them to lose tonight. That's what I want, really. I don't really want to start a war. I just want them to, I want England to score more goals. So that's uh, that's all I want for tonight. Uh, Brill, I think we'll get going. Um, fantastic. Um, lovely to see you all. As I apologise for those of you, I'm repeating myself too. I do apologise for those of you that arrived early. Um, we will be recording today's session. So if you don't want to be seen, please feel free to take a camera off. Um, you are muted as well. But if you could just keep yourself muted while the speakers are speaking today, that would be absolutely fantastic. Um, you will be able to enter any comments etc into the chat uh, box at the top of your screen and again you will be um there will be quick um q a sessions as well um for you to just um speak to the speakers directly and once the speakers have done their presentations and once again we're delighted to have um Peter Anderberg here from the Heat Network, Heat Academy, sorry, for my pardon. Um, and we were delighted to have him for the first session as well. So it's going to be really, really great today. And Peter, it's over to you. I just correcting the date of uh the slide. I see it's <laughs> it's actually the seventh, not the twenty second. <laughs> Welcome everybody. I enlarged the screen and uh, uh, this is uh, uh, as we heard the second session and uh, you will receive a recording of both sessions uh, once we've done the one today. I'll forward a link so that you can access and I will also include the previous session in this link. Uh, the, the previous sessions, if I just move to that agenda, was very much focusing on uh, building efficiency. And first, we had an overall view of what are the ambitions in in, uh, in uh, Staffordshire region in terms of decarbonisation uh, investments in decarbonisation, but also on a broader perspective and the UK level. Uh, and then we moved into two key topics. One was building efficiency. What can you do to reduce the demand of heat uh, in existing buildings? and also looking at another uh, area that's sustainable heat sourcing and we very much focused in on geothermal heating uh, which has led to some follow-up conversations we had as actually as a result of, of the meeting we had on the 22nd we had a smaller workshop involving uh, the chamber of commerce but also stoke uh, city council keel university hydrock Seraphy and the Geothermal Energy Advancement Association to discuss how can we take this forward, not just to, to leave it in as an interesting topic in a webinar, but actually trying to translate the energy we had in the meeting in the webinar into some concrete actions. And we're going to come back to you after the holidays with a more in-depth follow-up uh, conversation around geothermal. The opportunities in Staffordshire are tremendous, as we could hear last time both in terms of mine heat, but also, which is also very interesting, deep um, geothermal. So we're going to come back on that deep dive after the holidays, uh, focusing on um, on uh, on the geothermal side. But next week we are running actually a session involving quite a few of the participants at last session focusing on mine heat on the 13th of July. I'll tell you a bit more about that after the session. 
another topic we looked into was uh, um, building efficiency. How do we re reduce the demand of heat in buildings? Uh, and we also looked into what are the drivers uh, to drive to, to change and to upgrade buildings to reduce their uh, dependency on heat. Looking at the session at town today, we are going to focus in more on the heat network side of it. Uh, we're going to start off looking at why heat networks work and also how they work. Uh, and perhaps even more important than that is how do we actually make them work? Where we're going to listen into a few technology suppliers who have a long experience uh, in this sector and bring it, bringing in, in this case today, more fairly new technologies, new solutions, uh, digital solutions, and also some new uh, products that can facilitate the, the development and operations and maintenance of heat networks. Uh, we would like to have, and we're going to try to drive that, a kind of a discussion at the end of the session, both looking into how do we secure capability and actually delivering the projects in terms of training and innovation, but also another another topic we need to address to is the capacity gaps to really look into how can we expand the capacity in the supply chain. And this is one of the objectives of these sessions, it's actually to try to mobilize the local supply chain in the, the region of Staffordshire to these investments now uh, gearing up in coming years. And there will be plenty of new business opportunities and that's what we want to try to highlight with these uh, sessions. Uh, so that was the background. Uh, before I let our first speaker in, I will um, take away that and then move into giving those who didn't attend the last session just a quick recap also on where we started the conversation. Decarbonizing the economy, as we all know in, the for in this forum, uh, is a top priority currently and driven obviously by climate emergency and there is a very very strong to get the fossil fuels out of the system very quickly and one good area to start in is in the, the heating sector where looking at the UK market but also several other countries in Europe and in North America almost half of the gas consumption is used to heat buildings and that represents potentially as much as in some cases up to 40, 45% of total CO2 emissions. So if we could do something with heat, we could actually have a very big impact on the CO2 emissions. And also uh, looking at other drivers, not only the climate emergency, uh, but also the risks uh, related to be dependent on gas, uh, long transport route, logistical routes, political challenges and risks, but also the balance of trade uh, where UK in the past 10 years have moved from being a net exporter to a very big net importer of gas, which costs quite a lot of money for the economy. But then also referring back to uh, the ambitions of this session is to mobilize the local supply chain to thereby help uh, local regeneration, creating new jobs, new businesses, inward investments, and thereby also giving uh, the council a stronger position to address social welfare issues. So these are the background and we had Bob Barnes from Nordic Heat uh, joining us last week as well and I think you're with us today as well Bob uh, and you presented um, kind of a, I wouldn't say forecast, but a kind of a scenario for where we could see gas prices heading going forward. And it is very likely, and I think everybody agreed last time, that there will be carbon charges pr relatively soon. And that would, together with increased costs for distribution, uh, could lead to almost doubling of the gas prices uh, in the next couple of uh, well, in the next decade, which would have an enormous impact, obviously, on ordinary people's learn, uh, you know, ability to heat their homes. So there, there is this kind of driver as well, and I think carbon charges, taxation is bound to come. We can't avoid it. That That is necessary to, to meet the climate emergency challenges. Uh, with that as a background, I'd like to hand over 
uh, well, I, I'll take one more slide and jump these because we can come back to them later. When it comes to uh, decarbonization of heating, as I said on the first two sessions, uh, the first session, we look very much on the conservation, on building efficiency, and uh, also on sustainable heat sourcing in the conversation we had was on geothermal primarily. Today, we're going to focus on the one in the middle, uh, the pipe network, the heat network, which is critical to really carbonize heating. And I will like to, I'm very grateful that you could join us today, Michael. You're based in China, but you have a very long uh, experience and background from the development of the uh, heat network in uh, Stockholm. So I hand over to you. Thank you very much, Peter. I will try to share my screen here. So I hope you can see and hear me well. Yes, so my name is Michael Jacobson. I started out uh, it's about almost 20 years ago to be responsible for the design and operation optimization of the Stockholm uh, district heating and district cooling system. Uh, so I will share some experience about that and also what we are experience uh, nowadays. So like Peter mentioned, I am uh, based in Beijing in China today and are developing district heating and district cooling systems in the region here. Uh, taking departure, of course, of a lot of the knowledge from, from Northern Europe, but also things that are developed locally. Uh, that would also be the case in UK and, and that we will come to uh, later in the program today. So with that said, uh, I would like to start out with the question about what is district heating? Uh, what we have seen around the world is that there is a perception that district heating always is a city-wide uh, huge system, which sometimes uh, is not really the case and it's also not the most uh, feasible way of, of uh, developing district heating systems. So how we normally uh, define it is that it is a heating system uh, with one or more centralized production facilities for multiple buildings where we achieve scale advantages. Uh, compared to individual heating technologies. There are many uh, benefits uh, to achieve with district heating networks. We will for sure come into more uh, examples of that today, but to mention a few, we have the financial and economic benefits, uh, including the long lifespan that is for modern district heating systems. We see from Northern Europe that the lifespan is up to 50 years for uh, individual uh, facilities. Uh, we achieve higher energy efficiency and systemic efficiency where we have a more holistic uh, approach of the total energy system. Obviously, environmental efficiency. And then there are other benefits that comes out of the district heating systems, which includes things like reliability and, and these kind of factors. If we look at how district heating has evolved over time, uh, it started out more than 100 years ago, where it typically was steam systems with very high uh, temperature levels. Then it has moved uh, over time to become more and more efficient. The main driver from the beginning with district heating was uh, maybe obviously to remove pollution from cities. But later on, we have seen more benefits coming with the district heating system where we can uh, utilize different kind of fuels, apply new technologies, which has evolved uh, constantly over time. And today, where we are talking about, we're at the fourth generation district heating often, where we have lower temperature and are able to utilize low grade energy in our uh, energy systems. And now looking into even fifth generation uh, district energy systems, which often are used uh, combined for both heating and cooling purposes. So this is one way of how to define the development of district heating. However, each country, each market is unique 
the preconditions are different, like we heard here before. I mean, just uh, such things as uh, carbon taxes or fuel prices uh, uh, and so on is different, obviously, in different markets, but also different within a country and different cities. All the district heating systems that we have experienced over the years are totally unique. Of course, we can drag a lot of experiences from other, uh, and we are fortunate. I've been involved in some 80 district energy systems to be developed and optimized, whereof maybe 20 is cooling and 60 is heating. And there are always some things to drag on uh, in regards to, to experiences from other places. However, we should remember that everything, uh, all the time we have to uh, adapt to the local conditions and that there is not always uh, shelf solutions, even though that uh, we, can, we can take departure from great technologies out there. Uh, common nowadays are to talk about smart district heating. It's a buzzword going around. Uh, it goes hand in hand with eco cities, low carbon cities, smart cities and so on. Um, often this is related to individual components connected to the internet or something. We often um, want to highlight that when we talk about smart, it is a multidimensional, uh, we can say, thing. We have to think both about the features that we want to achieve. We want to achieve flexibility. So we have a flexible system, both in regards to uh, changes in demand on, on short term basis, but also able to expand uh, over time when, when the demand is, is changing. Obviously, we want it to be intelligent. We want it to be integrated, which is new features today where we can integrate district heating into multi-energy systems with uh, gas, electricity, heating, cooling and storage, uh, where district heating plays a very important role for uh, decarbonization. Obviously efficiency, but it's also important that it is competitive. And, and here comes again uh, a very great importance about the local conditions, uh, how this should be developed and, and designed and, and also operated. And finally, reliability and safety. So the features is, is one dimension, as we normally say. But when we talk about developing smart district heating system, we also have to think about the system value chain from production, transmission, distribution, consumption. We need to achieve these kind of feature uh, in all parts of the system, but also in the project value chain. When we start from planning, design, procurement, implementation or construction installation, and then over to operation and management, we have to think about this uh, throughout the whole uh, project value chain simply. So it is a multifaceted thing, and that's why we are here today. I would like to share some experiences from Sweden. As Peter mentioned, I uh, started out there and uh, did a lot of analysis on the systems. And I think I still today are remembering the names of most of the, I should not say most, but many of the substations and the block and, and so on, going into very much details of, of the uh, substations and so on. What you can see on this picture is quite fascinating. Uh, I don't think you can identify one single chimney uh, from this view, obviously, if we turn the camera, it might be different, but we will anyway not see many because the, all the small boilers are replaced by uh, centralized facilities or, or other kind of technologies that does not require any chimneys. Some background about the situation in Sweden. So Sweden is uh, planning to become carbon neutral by 2045, Stockholm by 2040 and the Swedish heating sector should become fossil free by 2030. Stockholm Exergy, which is the name of the energy utility in uh, the district energy utility in Stockholm, uh, aims to become carbon negative or climate positive by 2025. And um, even though the, de the development of the district heating system started about six, more than 60 years ago uh, in Stockholm, uh, a lot have actually happened here in the past uh, decades. It's been a very rapid development uh, in the past two decades where many small systems have been interconnected. Uh, there are many production facilities that has been replaced to more clean uh, fuels. Uh, we have six district heating companies that are trading heat with each other. 
Uh, we have uh, district heating utilities who is even co-investing in base load facilities and peak load facilities. And there is coordinated municipal heat planning and joint production planning. So this is something that has intensed a lot for the past two decades, this development. What we can see in the graph in the bottom, in the middle, which is the fuel mix in Stockholm, we can see that coal was intended to be phased out by 2022, but actually it was already last year. So now there is only a few percent uh, that is based on fossil fuels uh, when it comes to the district heating supply in Stockholm. What is worth to notice is the wastewater heat pumps, uh, which is also including a little bit of seawater heat pumps, but this kind of heat recovery is covering up to 20% of the heat supply in Stockholm, which is a fair share uh, for that kind of um, relatively simple uh, technology to just recover heat. The system is data-driven, and we call it pool-operated district heating system. There are 20 production sites uh, that are feeding in heat to the same network. And that, in order to operate this automatically and efficiently, there is a great need to have data-driven tools. And that I saw in the program that we will hear more of how to establish this kind of backbone for data-driven pool-operated district heating system, uh, which is obviously um, the backbone for smart district heating. I would like to mention some technologies that are used in Stockholm. So I mentioned heat recovery. So we have seawater and lake water heat recovery. We have heat recovery from the sewage water. Since 2008, there has been a great focus on recovering heat from data centers. So there are some 10 data centers that are uh, providing their excess heat to the district heating system. There are some industries that are also providing heat to the district heating system and obviously for, for many decades the, the power plants have been combined heat and power plants um, but there are uh, has been a great development in this aspect even though obviously in Stockholm uh, it's not that much industries uh, so it's more about the wastewater and, and data center heat recovery. Recently this has become even more focus on as the Stockholm and uh, Stockholm Exergy is focusing on becoming uh, climate positive. So nowadays there is also heat recovery from supermarkets and, and these kind of um, yeah, facilities, uh, as well as providing heat to traditionally not common heat consumers. Um, so for example, to heating up uh, uh, swimming pools or, or greenhouses and things like that is also something uh, that is going on now as the, the final step of heat recovery and utilization of, of heat and, and increasing the, the district heating supply in the city. Even the ISO, as, as obviously uh, coming from Sweden, uh, we are not very fond of talking football today, so that's worth to mention that for the ice hockey, uh, stadiums, there is also heat recovery from the chillers there. So. Waste to energy obviously is uh, common in, in Stockholm and uh, it's including both municipal solid waste as well as uh, industrial waste. Um, and this is used for uh, both production of uh, power, heating and cooling. That percentage that I mentioned about fossil fuel that is still in the Stockholm system uh, is mainly from the fossil content of the municipal solid waste. So, so that's, that's where that comes from and is still um, accounted for. In order to become uh, carbon positive, uh, climate positive and carbon negative, uh, there has been a pilot project going on and finalized in Stockholm uh, when it comes to carbon capture, which has been very successful, which has uh, received several awards recently and also raised more funds to put it into an even larger scale and, and also to be able to export this kind of technology. And again, this is one example of a technology in Stockholm that has been popular, that has been developed locally due to the market trends in Stockholm. This is what we see in new markets also. No matter we're working in China or in Kazakhstan or, or other countries, 
when we are developing new local markets, because in these countries, they have also had district heating in, on, on a country level for, for 60, 70 years, but there are still cities that are developing district heating from scratch. There is also the trend that there are local uh, companies that are developing new technologies able to export, which is kind of a result of developing this kind of district heating uh, schemes. Uh, even though this is not in Stockholm, uh, as at that time when I worked in Stockholm, the, the company was Fortum, so we also looked into heat recovery from nuclear power plants. Uh, but this is uh, maybe more, uh, it could be relevant maybe in, in some places in, in, in the UK, but, but uh, obviously similar technology is, is for uh, remote power plants where it could be uh, heat to be recovered. And the concept of long transmission pipelines is uh, very mature today. We are designing, it's a very safe design, able to do all kinds of uh, transient analysis and such that is required to ensure the safety of pipelines that are longer than 100 kilometers. Then finally, I would like to mention geothermal heat. And this is something that we touched upon last time. Uh, and I think after here, I would like to uh, hear maybe a little bit more uh, in regards to geothermal. Uh, from Carl here, because what we see uh, now here in, in, in Asia is that if we look back 10, 15 years, uh, there was quite, quite some attempt on geothermal heat, uh, but also quite failed projects, uh, which has created some uh, skepticism. However, uh, what we do see is that the technologies and the knowledge have improved a lot, and there are several geothermal projects now implemented they have great success and uh, what i understand here from what i heard last session we had that we are seeing the same in other places around the world this is this is really something that is booming at the moment to utilize uh, deep geothermal so with that i would like to thanks for your attention and hand over to peter and carl i think yeah, thanks a lot for that, Michael. And I'm shuffling around a bit in the agenda today because I know, Carl, you need to leave a bit earlier because you have another session coming uh, coming up. But again, I find it very interesting in my many years in the sector. Uh, we haven't talked that much about the geothermal, uh, shallow, obviously, heat pumps, uh, ground source heat pump, but uh, deep geothermal. There have been some tests in Sweden or big projects which have failed and it has got a bad, bad reputation. But I think over the past year, I feel there is more and more of a conversation. And I think it's also driven by, I, I'll leave it to you to introduce yourself, Carl, but you coming from another sector, oil and gas, with a different mindset and, and also lots of experience in drilling. Uh, so I think you share my view that that's a big topic right now. Yeah, thank you, Peter and uh, Mikhail. That's really good and useful. Uh, yeah, um, so my name's Carl Farr and I'm the CEO of um, Seraphy Energy. And um, yeah, we do. We we came really. We come at this really from an oil and gas um, viewpoint. Um, you know, I've spent over 30 years in oil and gas along with the co-founders of the company. And uh, you know, millions of wells have been drilled around the world in in oil and gas um, for well over 150 years now. Um, and, you know, one thing we've learned from them is that every well has heat and temperature. Um, and, you know, we can use that primarily as a benchmark to identify, you know, thermal gradients in certain locations. Most countries around the world have tried to drill for oil and gas or done some form of exploration somewhere along the line. So even going back, you know, to the 60s, 50s, 70s, you know, there's, there's information available we can pull on. And, uh, you know, primarily this um, this has really been a case of really looking at um, initially we started looking at the reuse of oil and gas wells, which is primarily what we are focusing at, at the moment as being sort of a way to de-risk some of the projects in the geothermal space and certainly from a heat heat and aspect. And uh, we're currently, you know, got multiple projects ongoing where we're we're looking at assets which are effectively dead assets in oil and gas, um, effectively more like liabilities. Um, for oil and gas companies where we can convert them liabilities uh, using the downhole temperature from the heat. Um, we have some technology, design technology, which is um, 
somewhat off the shelf sort of way of thinking in an oil and gas industry using the sort of concepts of heat exchanges and using the concept of um, really sort of linking the ground force uh, ground source heat pump world into deep geothermal um, and really taking an order of magnitude different approach to it so rather than looking at multiple boreholes to provide you know uh, tens of um, megawatts or kilowatts of uh, energy for heating networks is actually get order of magnitude um, uh, sort of results by looking at hundreds of degrees rather than sort of tens of degrees uh, and flow rates and temperatures at high high depth um, or lot big, bigger depths that can be used for wider scale um, energy uh, and, and that also applies for CHP so bringing the sort of power model into the game um, and when you do that you actually bring a, an order of magnitude uh, level of de-risk and um, ability to scale uh, or level of scale a lot more efficiently. Um, so really, we've started. You know, we're new kids on the block in the sort of ground source heat pump and the sort of heating network area. But um, you know, we do see this sort of uh, oil and gas um, sort of, I would say, mentality um, sort of transferring over to be able to really help assist the 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 heat and network sort of type environment so you know we very much look at this sort of donut hub area type approach which um you know pete's mentioned on several occasions here and our approach is really like one big no donut putting a well in the middle and then going out of that sort of order of magnitude several kilometers and seeing what you can catch in that sort of donut loop um and you can you know from you know order of magnitude effectively a megawatt of uh, electricity is sort of equivalent to five megawatts of thermal energy at the sort of temperatures we're looking at and you know that sort of very very quickly starts to equate to a good good um economic model in when you start then to look at you know combining you know electricity with a heat heat um offtake and nowadays we're also talking of things like hydrogen and green hydrogen and all sorts of other things that specifically in island states and communities where we're looking at, um, you know, across the world where, um, you know, desalination, water treatment, all these things are all part of the sort of energy solution and energy mix. And uh, if you can decarbonize parts of that through use of heat and use of hot temperature, uh, as well as providing electricity, then you can obviously start looking at then, at, um, you know, making people a lot more energy. So, Again, it's about, you know, taking more of a sort of a, a, a larger scale look at this, but um, really doing it at a scale. And that also helps to de-risk investors appetite in these types of projects, which is really important for moving this to the next stage. Um, you know, nobody wants to develop a project that's not commercial. And, uh, you know, we need to move away from the sort of concept of projects being sort of science projects and, and like tests rather than actually a commercial solution and actually going to deliver some value and revenue for somebody because everyone wants a return. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is some of the sort of areas we've been focusing on, and you know, we like I said, we're we're sort of new kids on the block in this space, but in some ways, bringing a sort of historical approach and proven off the shelf sort of uh, approach to project delivery, and also the use of heat and use of energy from the ground, you know, whether it be uh, from an oil and gas space or whether it be using the heat, you know, the the ability to use it in a way it's effectively com commercialized is really, I think, is, and, and at scale is really important, you know. Yeah, and I think it's great uh, for us in the sector. I've been here for a long time that there are new experiences, new perspectives coming in, and it's also kind of an uh, uh, it, it confirms that this is an interesting sector because it attracts a lot of talented people and and you know big business. We're going to meet later today people coming from telecom uh, into this sector, uh, and we're going to see their perspective on how they change things. Uh, Ian Stimson, I, I see you're with us and you were also presenting kindly at the last session. And one, one reason why we focus that much on geothermal when it comes to Staffordshire is that there is a big potential in Staffordshire. There are two mine heat uh, projects that, that can be evolved, uh, uh, developed quite rapidly. But you have also been involved in research when it comes to deep geothermal, Ian. Yes, indeed. Um... The advantage of Staffordshire is that uh, we, we've seen from the old coal workings that we've got quite a high geothermal gradient, that uh, having the, the coal measures close to the surface acts as a, like a, a bit of a thermal blanket. It traps the heat in and with a uh, shallow basement, it's, we've got this really nice combination uh, that gives us the, 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 these higher temperatures closer to the surface 
uh, which means that you know if you need to drill new wells then you don't have to go as far to get the temperatures that you need for say combined heat and power yeah and, and there is uh, there is actually and um, has been for 10 years a project underway in Stoke and Trent uh, which is quite quite significant i think it is if i recall it correctly uh, uh, 15 uh, megawatts or perhaps even more uh, in terms of cap of effect. Uh, so what's stopping these projects now, Carl? Do you think there is a change now? Will these projects take off? I think I think that one of the biggest challenges is always about um, funding, you know. I mean, projects take off when investors have money and uh, when people see a commercial reason for doing something, um, you know, it, with all the goodwill in the world of decarbonisation and everything else, you know, it's not going to happen if there's uh, somebody at the end of the day is not making somewhere down the line and money and, uh, you know, investors are getting a return. Um, it, it's not all, it can't all be on the back of um, love, hugs and kisses and everyone trying to save the world. You know, it needs to be on the back of commercial solutions. Um, and, you know, again, you, you, there are ways you can de-risk this. And, uh, you know, again, it's it's looking at it from that oil and gas mentality. You know, you have to make it work. There are challenges. There are, what you know, always going to be challenges in the way and, and things that, you know, stop things uh, or try to stop things working. But you have to find another way to do it. So if it's not commercial in its, uh, as it's presented today, uh, you then have to try and make it commercial by presenting and including something else or other type of um, process to actually make it commercial. And what we're finding is uh, certainly in the in the sort of district heat network side, and certainly when you look at housing and residential type of projects, um, a lot of these projects aren't becoming commercial because they're they're looked at very small scale. So you know, 20 houses or you know, 100 houses or something like this. And you know, in in a lot of cases, and 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 the, and the scalability of that small scale is actually preventing it from being commercial in many cases, or being a solution that somebody will back. Um, where you start adding value is when you start add, adding in large industry uses and large processes like that, where you can have large takeoff for industry. And uh, again, the way our approach is to put a, effectively a dot in the map where effectively a, a one of our wells or two of our wells could be and then see what we can catch in that area in a mile or two mile sort of radius. And uh, then they become the off takes. And effectively, if you get a big industrial user, which uses, you know, in the sort of hundreds of, of degrees heat, which we can produce from a deep well, the the other part of, in, of the heat network, i.e. the district heating and residential heating that becomes a secondary use of heat so you sort of start scaling it down so you know you have your primary heat that might be account for 60 70 percent of your offtake but then you can then start slowly adding in the other secondary heat users which could be your residential your housing associations and larger district type approaches city buildings etc cetera, etc cetera. and they just add then stack up the value proposition for a, for an for a return on investment and, you know, as we've seen on a number of occasions, which, um, you know, people have presented and certainly the numbers about gas um, prices and, you know, carbon credits and taxes, we are going down that road where that price is going to hike in very, very shortly. And it won't be a hike over a matter of years. It will be a hike that will come in a matter of weeks yep. uh, and it will be driven by, you know, uh, OPEC and other things driving up gas prices and driving up oil prices. And we'll suddenly get that that peak. So this isn't some this isn't a problem we need to deal with in three or four years time. This is a problem we need to deal with now. And it will happen that quickly when we when it comes. And we've seen it happen in oil and gas and we've seen it happen in different industries like that. So yeah, it needs a it's something we need to deal with at scale. It needs a order of magnitude, more more aggressive approach. Uh, and that's really how we're sort of coming at it, you know. I remember the first dialogue you, you and I had, Carl, uh, quite a while ago now, where, where I presented district heating and you said you can't just connect the school, you need to yeah. connect the city. And I think that's a, a change in, and, and you used some other words when explaining and really emphasizing what you felt. Uh, but but that that's really the mindset that you have from the oil and gas industry, which I think we need to, we, we need to adopt. Uh, we can't be too shy with this, but the back, the, the, the challenge is, as you say, the commercial viability of it. I should mention um, before moving forward in this in this webinar, the company that Michael presented, the Stockholm Exergy, or which is today Stockholm Exergy, it has had different names through history. 50% of that company was just sold. 
uh, and they got uh, 3 billion euros for that 50% stake. So there is money in this, and we should also keep in mind that many of the energy companies, district energy operators in Nordics, they make 9, 10% plus on return on equity. So it's not that they are, they are very costly to build in the early mm -hmm. days, but the, the returns uh, are great moving forward. Uh, thanks Ian and Carl for, and I hope you can stay with us for some more time. Uh, we are going to move forward. And one of the challenges with uh, deep geothermal, for instance, in, in Stoke and Trent, is that you can't just drill. Uh, I'm not a geologist, but I would imagine you will end up with a geyser in the center of Stoke, and that's not uh, useful. So you need a heat network. You need something to distribute the heat when you get it up. Uh, and then brings us back to Michael's presentation of district heating. But more importantly now, in this perspective, it brings us over to you, Sebastian, because you're actually developing a heat network in Stoke on Trent and with the mindset of, uh, of um, uh, someday connecting it to a heat, to a deep geothermal. Uh, I see there are different questions popping up in the chat. We're going to address them. But before that, we hand over to you, Sebastian. OK, thank you, Peter, and I'm going to try to share my screen. Hopefully. Um, OK, and hopefully you should be able to see my screen. Can, Peter, can you confirm? Uh, yeah, it's visible if you just enlarge the slide. Yeah, that's, as well. good. Yeah. that's good. OK, Perfect. good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sebastian Daniels from Stockholm Trans City Council. Uh, in the next uh, hopefully 15, 20 minutes, I'll take you through uh, various points. But before we go into the details, just like to give a little bit of UK background in terms of energy use and emissions. It's going to be very quickly, don't worry, but it gives a bit of a picture about why we, we are embarking into this uh, this project of district network in a city. Uh, look at legislation as well and uh, what the UK government looks at decarbonizing its system and what are the solutions. Uh, and we go back to what really Peter asked me to do, which is the, the 3C concept, which is conserve energy connect network and convert to a decarbonized heat source. So uh, hopefully we'll go through that. So to go through uh, a little bit of UK background, these are different pie there showing the primary energy use uh, in the UK. Um, and it's very interesting if you look at the first pie, uh, the purple part and the this brown part, this is petrol and this is natural gas. So you can see that almost Two thirds of the UK currently is using fossil fuel, uh, and that's what we need to try to either win ourselves off or make this fossil fuel clean in a way. And a lot of people talk about carbon captures and things like that, but it's a big task. That's what we're saying there. And when we look at the, how this primary energy is used, it's very interesting that heat is the white elephant or the black sheep, whatever you want to call it, because it's using 45% of this total energy in, in the country, uh, actually. And when you look at transport, it's only close to, but it's 41%. Uh, and the blue and, and the brown part there, it's really about electricity in a sense. So all I'm saying there is very interesting that in the last decade, uh, we've actually greened a little bit of the electricity, but actually the electricity wasn't so bad in comparison to heat and transport. Uh, so now we need to tackle heat. And when we look at heat, what does heat mean as a country? Uh, this pie, the last one on your right hand side, the dark brown is basically space heating. This is your radiator to, or your, your, to keep your, 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 your building warm. And the next part, uh, this is your water which is basically in 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 uh, in uh, domestic hot water and all sorts of showers and and things like this so and all this is more or less this heat is more or less made by gas 66 percent in total uh, so that it and in terms of emissions but before we go into emissions uh, the uk has got probably one of the most extensive uh, gas grids in Europe. 80% uh, of the houses in the UK are connected. I uh, will say probably 90%, 95% of the houses in Stoke on Trent in the city are connected to the gas grid. So this is what, in a sense, we're going to we are competing against currently. And it's a very large market. It's about 1.6 million boilers being replaced or, um, or, 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 or maintained every year, installed or replaced, sorry, every year. So it's it's a big market to kind of uh, 
compete against, is what I'm saying. But when we look at the graph on the right hand side, uh, these are the total emissions, uh, CO2 uh, ton equivalent uh, of the country per year. And if you look at it again, it's about 37% of the total emissions as a country. We look at space heating and hot water, which is really mainly our dwellings and our, our, our buildings, that's equate to 21%. So that's why the challenge here is, is uh, and has been for many years, and I'm glad that we're starting having some resonance now that heating is really the next things we need to decarbonize if we really want to meet our targets. Now, I'm going to bore you with UK legislation, strategy and policy. You'll be able to read that when you can receive the slides. But the three first top bullet, bullet points there basically are showing you that currently uh, there's been some strong kind of visions from the government in terms of being net zero by 2050. Uh, the UK was one of the first country in the world to actually enact this target. So it's basically saying that it's uh, it's illegal not to reach it, which uh, in a sense is quite quite interesting. Um, and late, uh, late last year, the, the government has put a bit of a 10-point plan in terms of approach about how we're going to uh, reach these targets in, through a green industrial revolution, and there was an energy white paper. This, these are really what basically the travel of directions are. They're not really as detailed as maybe you would think. The details comes under the following bullet points underneath, and I've seen after them in orange, where there's a lot of things which is in the making in terms of policy, in terms of how do we get to net zero, how do we decarbonize, how do we do a lot of things about future homes and so on. Um, but what's interesting is obviously you're probably aware in November, the UK will be hosting COP26 in Glasgow. And what I'm suspecting here is that in November, we're going to have a lot of these other policies and strategy published and ready. Uh, and hopefully the UK will be leading the, the, the pack towards uh, decarbonization of heat, hopefully. Because that's really important because ambitions are great, policy uh, are okay, but need stability to make sure that everybody can invest in the right things. Now, what are the three kind of silver bullets? Because there isn't a single silver bullet currently, but the government is looking at heat decarbonization. It's basically heat pump, so which is a core electrification of heat. So it's using basically heat pump for many media. You know, it could, most of them will be probably hair source, but it could be water source like we've heard earlier. And district heating has got its, uh, its share on, on this as well, especially in, in city centers where we probably already existing system or if there are potential for future systems. Them. And the last one is hydrogen, hydrogen boiler, but obviously this is probably a, a decade away because there's a lot of uh, things to be done in terms of converting and and um, hydrogen in kind of large scale, commercially viable and in a clean way as well. And also about infrastructures to, to make sure those and uh, it's interesting that locally as well, uh, near Stockholm Trent and Kiel University have been doing a lot of blending of hydrogen in their own grid to see how that works and there are some interesting results. But to go back to the main book of this conversation this afternoon, so what Peter asked me to do is ask me about doing the first C, which is conserve, which is about building efficiency. And before we embark into things which are always quite challenging and interesting about creating energy, that's great. How can we actually reduce our energy uh, consumption? Uh, and, and that's really something we, we, which is key and should be done first, but quite often it isn't. Um, you can see there with the, the little interesting logo uh, houses to show what kind of inefficiency our housing stock uh, uh, looks like, but we're losing a lot of energy through various parts of of uh, a building. And there is hard measure we can install and, and you know, changing windows and putting uh, insulation. Uh, the, these are fairly standard and a lot of them have been done already, but there's more we can do to ensure that we get to uh, an energy efficiency band there between A and G to a, a better one. So what we look there is reducing energy before we actually provide energy replacement like for like is what can we do to actually reduce that? Uh, and these are the hard measure, but they are also soft measures. Uh, and this soft measure we, we looked at as a, as a local authority, what we could do on those. And to look at the particular example, the civic center you see in the picture there in Stoke-on-Trent um, is uh, hopefully going to be connected to the district network in the, in the near future. And what we wanted to do is look at how we actually 
move from gas boiler to distributed network system because that's very different. And the graph you show there is sort of a, a bit more of a, than a week uh, and basically is the business as usual, BIU stands for business as usual. And what you've got is, is the consumption of gas. But basically what it shows you is when there's no consumption, the heating is off. Uh, and when suddenly you need a lot is because it turns on. And if you see over a day what happens, and that's quite often the case for most of the buildings uh, around the cities, people don't heat their home or their buildings overnight. So they leave the heating off. And then in the morning when they wake up, they want the heating to be really uh, nice and comfortable to, have, uh, to, to, to start uh, their day. And quite consequently, there is a massive peak, as you can see, coming in terms of capacity just to ensure that the, the building is ready. And after throughout the day, just seven out. And again, over the night, it stops and it starts again. And this is like very kind of sort of binary, sort of on and off, on and off, on and off. And that doesn't quite work with the district network. Uh, we need something which is more constant. So what we looked at is how we could actually uh, put our building into a different kind of uh, architecture system. And this is what we've done. Um, we've actually, um, we had three boilers. We, we turned two off and we put one on and we, leave the, we left the heating on for all day long, 24 seven, even overnight. And we just reduced the set point to get to a lower temperature at a certain time. And that translated into the same curve here, which show basically the gas consumption. But as you can see, it's a bit more flatter. It is a bit up and down. That's because this, this curve has not been degree day corrected in a sense, not been normalized. So it's probably there when it was going down, it was quite warm on that day and coming back up because the following day was maybe it was cold. That was over the winter, as you can see, it's in February. And, but the two key points to look at on, on these two graphs is the first graph, when you see the maximum peak at the top there, that's about 250 kilowatts of gas consumption. When, when you look at this top peak there, it's about 160 kilowatts. So we shaded 100 kilowatts of, uh, of capacity in essence. And that has translated uh, into a fuel decrease of 6.2%. But interestingly enough, we've actually increased the heat in the building by 5.7%. Why is that? Is is because of direct correlation with the boiler efficiency, and uh, because we also reduce uh, the flow and the temperature. So we don't only turn boilers off, but reduce. You can only use the temperature and flow, as you know, into any uh, heating system. So reduce the flow instead of being originally 75 degrees, we reduce it to 55 degrees. And that means that the condensing boilers, which were installed, were able to condense, so they would become more efficient, so using less gas. And also with um, reducing the flow uh, of the water going through the whole system, um, we, we, we also didn't have to warm up much, much more volume of, of water coming back. So that's interesting. But I call it a soft measure because we've done nothing here. We haven't spent any money to do that. All we've done is actually retwig our controls and trying to think slightly different with the kit we've got today. And by making these flat curves, and let's say we can already save 6.2%. But the important thing is this can be improved. And I think there's other talk later on uh, by using machine learning intelligent controls, which is all about artificial intelligence and learning for using the system. So the system learns itself about when to turn the heating on, when to turn it off, because it's got a very good understanding of how the building uh, perform in essence, uh, and and we haven't got that currently, but we are in the in the process of changing that through our BMS system to bring this intelligent smart system, uh, and and also you can do that by you need to do having more sensors and that's what we heard a bit earlier on as well with uh, internet of things because it's all about data the, the the more data you fit to the the artificial intelligence module the more it can actually make the right decision so there's a lot of more things we can we can do on, on that on the, on the soft measure but that these two obviously need some capital investment um, we stopped before any capital investment and still save about six six percent uh, of our energy bill uh, not even being on the network yet now, connect, and that's the importance of creating infrastructures for district network. And uh, I'm not going to regurgitate what uh, Michael have said earlier, but obviously 
in networks have got four major components. One of the most important one is the one on your right hand side, which is customer, the block in green. Uh, no customer, no hit network. And that's very important um, because even if you got a fantastic hit source, which is on the other part of the the graph there in red, the generation, you might have a fantastic hit source, but if you have a customer, you, you're not going to be able to do anything with it. Uh, but in the middle, that's where you got the distribution. So if you got plenty of customers and you got some good, good hit source, you need to put this network in place. And this is what you can see on the ground, which is where you put, install your pipes. Uh, and this is the non-sexy part of things of this network because we'll see in a minute what, what does that entail and, and how does it look like. And obviously on top of that, you need to put the kind of commercial vehicle to purchase the heat from the producer and sell it to the uh, the hand users uh, and using the system uh, and that's what we call supply uh, and a fundamental part is you can't work in this block in isolation because they all intertwine together. If one is missing, the whole thing collapses. So it's really important to have them all uh, working together. And the whole system approach is really key. You can't just say, "I've got, I've got a demand. Can you do something with this rich network?" You need to work out if it's feasible with a heat source and if the distribution system, because to start with is not too large, because you can have a great heat source and great load, but is it maybe a hundred kilometers away uh, when it's technically feasible to connect, it's probably commercially absolutely not viable because you, you're not going to be able to make enough money through the capex you need to invest for all this. So looking a little bit more in detail on the heat demand again, that's the heat demand we've ascertained for the city for the first phase, which is about 45 gigawatt hour. You got on the graph two colors, orange, that's the domestic hot water. So interesting to see that uh, regardless if it's winter, because here's January to December on this axis and on this axis, obviously the heat demand. Um, People take as many showers, as many baths throughout the year. It's not because suddenly it's the summer, they use less hot water. However, as you can see for the heating, obviously when you get to springtime, most of people turn off their heating in, in, in the UK or in Stoke uh, and they bring them back around September. So, uh, and again, what's happening with this graph is for this week network, you need to understand what maximum capacity you need to serve. And at the moment, that's the peak there. So that's the maximum capacity you need to produce it. And you need also this maximum capacity in your infrastructures to, to drive this energy from the production point to the hand user. And that suddenly means it's, it requires a lot of investment. I'm going to explain that in a minute. But if you can optimize the demand, it'll be the same thing which I explained about our civic centers and kind of instead of having all these peak as well, but trying to plateau those at a certain level. Uh, what does that mean? It means that we need lower capacity on the pipes, lower capacity in the production plants. And what does that translate to? Into cheaper capex, well, in less capex to be installed uh, because it's cheaper infrastructures. You don't have to install, I don't know, 20 megawatt of uh, gas boiler. You can maybe do it with 10 megawatt of gas boiler. So it's going to be much cheaper. And also the pipe is going to be smaller, so uh, smaller, smaller trench we'll see in a minute. So it's probably um, cheaper as well to install. But that's for obviously the utility company who's installing all this. What does that mean also for the OPEX? It means, well, especially for the volume of water, if it's less volume of water because the pipes are smaller, uh, it's going to be less pumping required and probably less heat losses because the pipes are smaller. So that's interesting. But ultimately, that's, that's for the company operating these schemes. But ultimately for the hand users, what that means, and I thought I put that, it means that you'll get a better uh, and cheaper affordable heat because you want because all this cost will be passed at the end of the day to the end user so everything is optimized and cheaper to run the cost of the heat at the end point uh, the point of use will be much cheaper so there is there is a thriving there especially competing against what i'll explain a very mature market of gas where it's really cheap to get a gas boiler it's really cheap to have a gas connection currently and um, we need to come in with this renewable with an offer which is uh, if not equal a little bit cheaper so it kind of makes people um, appealing to to swap uh, and that's really what we need to do about this optimization 
Now, before we construct the infrastructure, which is a network on the ground to, to go uh, from point of production to the end user, uh, there is a lot of construction, pre-construction work need to be done. Um, this is the kind of uh, surveys of all the other utilities you've got. So you can see the pipe here, which, which are the design pipe, and you can see what we have to interact with a lot of other um, 200, 150 years of utilities being sewer, being water, being gas, being fiber optics and, and, and so on. Uh, and as you can see, for example, here in 3D, uh, you see the two pipe, you see everything intersecting with this three pipe. And a lot of uh, information needs to be gathered front uh, and a lot of trial holds and a lot of uh, ground penetrating radar systems needs to be done to ensure that you get the best knowledge before you dig about what you're going to encounter. Um, and one of the interesting part quite often people understand about this ring network they say it's it's water pipes but it's not it's hot water pipes as you know uh, and as you know hot water we uh, expand uh, in i live in a, in a whole house here and when the heating kicks up in the morning you can hear all the floorboard cracking because basically um the system is is moving and a long system, you know, many kilometers, you can't put it on straight line because suddenly what happens, you're going to stress the park to the to its limit and it's probably going to rupture. And suddenly all your energy is going to go in the ground uh, because the hot water is going to be flowing and uh, warming the ground rather than the properties you want to connect. So this is why quite often you need to take in consideration expansion loop. Uh, and interesting, in Scandinavia, they, they don't necessarily do this because they put the line, the, they delay the pipe in a straight line, and before they backfill it, they just pre-stress it by putting a large current for it, which means the pipe expand and the steel has been pre-stressed, already moved up, so it's okay. But in the UK, we can't do that because we've got, for example, in Stockholm, a 300 years old city uh, where it, it would not be feasible uh, to, to to get this uh, level of trench open around uh, for, for long. And also, there's an element of traffic consideration. Um, if we have to open, you know, 500, 600 meters of trench at once to pre-stress the pipe, that means the whole city is gridlock and nobody can go to work or go shopping. Uh, so it's not possible. Uh, and consequently, these loops uh, are quite important to be calculated in advance because if you don't put them, your lifespan of your uh, system is going to reduce. And we heard about 50 years lifespan, which is great, but if it's not designed and installed properly, it's probably going down quite uh, drastically and very quickly down. Now, the actual construction, these are photos from Stockholm Trans, when they were about three years old and the first phase we installed. Um, and it, it's interesting, you can see one of these loops. And one of these loops, as you can see, uh, it's the trenching requirement is much higher than for straight pipe. Straight pipe, you got maybe, these are the end 500 uh, outer casing, so it's half a meter each in a sense. Um, and you got probably a 1.7 meters tr trench there width. Uh, when you need to make this U loop, suddenly you not only you stay on one side of the road, but you suddenly have to go on the other side of the road. So you need to preamp in advance where they're going to locate it to make sure that you can still have your traffic flowing around the city. So they, they, they're quite um, tricky walls. They need to be installed in, 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 in design in advance with the, in terms of location and review. And, I'll call these pictures because they're quite nice. It was a blue, blue sunny day, uh, the glossy pictures, because it looks like quite clean, quite neat. And I like this photo because it's a textbook in a sense. What you've got is you've got the two pipe here with your leak detection. And above you've got five ducts. That's to put your fiber optics, which goes along the, 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 the pipe. Uh, so you, you can track uh, what the system is doing. Uh, and you've got three just in case to spare or to lease to other people. So that, that's quite nice. But uh, and And it happens sometimes but most of the time it doesn't so let's have a look at the real situation when suddenly you start trenching especially in Stockholm Trent is famous for porcelain and, and ceramic uh, so there are 300 years of ceramic industry which has been thriving around and still thriving and when you start digging you what you found is probably quite often uh, a, a layer of pottery broken pottery because all these manufacturers where they had uh, refused from 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 the factory system they were just basically breaking and putting in the highway and um, but you need to start digging and it's not necessarily as clean always uh, saying you you encounter some uh, technical issues sometimes which you didn't know were there uh, despite all the effort you've done to pre-risk to de-risk that up front uh, and after you've got to lay the pipe when the trench is done and, and, and that's again this is 
could be challenging um, because if there are a lot of uh, utilities crossing, you can't just put the pipe down uh, because you need to thread it uh, underneath all these different crossing utilities, gas and fibers and so on. So it's a bit tricky. Uh, and then you need to weld this pipe and uh, welding is quite challenging in these conditions where you maybe have uh, you're on your back and you don't have a lot of space to turn around and you need to do a very good job at this welding because again that's why you want to guarantee the system to be there for an, at least 50 years so that, that's a big ask uh, and then you need to sleeve once you've done the, the the welding on the on the steel pipe you need to bridge the gap now with a plastic sleeve and put your foam uh, which insulate the pipe to make sure it doesn't have a lot of losses on top and then you backfill that properly so the highway is not in collapse. And um, when it's done, the magic is, is, is you can't tell anything. It's just under your feet, essentially. Uh, and suddenly it's, it's there. It's ready to be used, hopefully, for the next 50 years. It's been done properly. So this is the reality, and that's what you really need to, to, to be careful because when we say 50 years lifespan, it's as long as it's designed properly and as long as it's installed properly. Now on the customer connection side, which is once you've done your pipe works and this pipe works goes all the way to the verge of a property, um, you can either be on the top there with the three boilers uh, into a large property, that's probably a commercial property, uh, or you can be into a residential dwelling and you can see on the bo uh, a gas boiler there. So currently that's what they got. Interesting enough, again, going about efficiency, and, and Peter's always been an advocate of that. You've got three boilers there, and quite often that's the case you found in two large buildings. I can tell you one is 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 basically uh, if one of those break down, it's just uh, an emergency unit. So this one of them probably never will probably get used because they can swap usage between on. But what I'm saying, there is redundancy there already. And then you get two boilers because you've got one mainly for the probably the, 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 the main baseline. And after you go on another one to top up when it's really cold. So this is the kind of inefficiency you see already. Now, when you connect to this rig network, those are removed and they've been replaced by either on the top there is a substation for a large building or uh, what we call a heat interface unit for uh, a dwelling or residential site. Uh, these are like for like in terms of size, so there's not much in between those. Those, suddenly what happens is you've got three boilers, then this is much smaller. So suddenly you release a lot of space as well uh, on, on your plant room. But the important things as well on, on those is that here you've got a lot of maintenance going on for all these different parts inside. Here you suddenly have just a heat exchanger and some pipes, and the only moving part really could be a pump and some valves, uh, and they don't need a lot of uh, a lot of maintenance. So suddenly it's interesting. But the highest point, and suddenly, sadly, earlier this year there was a gas explosion in one of the house in the UK, and you can see there's one in one house, and it blows away three of the house because there was a gas leak, and this needs to be maintained in the gas boiler to make sure there isn't that such issue. It doesn't happen often, but when it happens, it's obviously quite bad. Now, when you replace with this re network, what happens is you don't have gas anymore coming into your building unless you've got to need to gas for all the means, all the things. But what you've got is hot water, so it's much more safer uh, in that respect. Um, and the key important things, uh, it's all about smart system these days, optimization. And you need to optimize to make sure that you're going to provide the best output for your client. And to do that, you, you need to monitor their use and you need to see how they could become more efficient. Uh, and to do that, you need all this system from, from, from uh, the plant room, but also all the way to the um, production side to be uh, connected, to be recording data. And smart is all about data. The more data you collect, the more you can understand. And it becomes big data. Sometimes it could be quite daunting and unmanageable, but that's really important. And I think we got some IT people who are going to tell to us about that in, in a short while. So the last point, which is convert, um, because as we heard about deep geothermal, yes, we have a deep geothermal proposition in, in stock. Uh, and, and I must say it's probably one of the, the best uh, the best one in the country in terms of this network, because we've got everything aligned. So we've got the network, which is in construction. We got a piece of land where the deep geothermal well can be. We've done all the seismic acquisition surveys, so we know the geology there. We know uh, where the, the, the source of water is, at what depth. So we've got everything inside. 
The only thing we haven't got currently is a large enough network to make it commercially viable. When we're going to have a large network and a big demand, then it's easier to, to, to have a better uh, commercial discussion uh, because there is a big investment to be done for deep geothermal. So what you do is, the best things to do is you put your pipe around the city, around your estate where it needs to be. And when you've got that, you probably start with what I would say a little bit of a dirty uh, source, because in our case, we're going to start with gas boiler, because that's, as I say, it's available anywhere and around the city, and, and it, it's a way to, to start. But over time and quickly, obviously, we're going to find that with the more and more building we connect, we get more and more uh, demand and more aggregated volume, and then we can start having uh, a view of low carbon heat source. Now, a lot of people think that low carbon is, is, is ready and it's there but commercially it's still more expensive than fossil fuel so we heard earlier about the price of gas and the price of electricity and so on. things need to be done in terms of carbon taxation to make sure that then we we've got the chance to to provide a solution which, which is better but at the moment gas is cheap so we'll use gas uh, but very very quickly we'll move into who knows deep geothermal um, recovery energy plant, we've got uh, currently an incinerator which uh, uh, is in the making in 2026. We should have a brand new one that we be connecting to the D3 network. Heat pump, mine water, obviously, we've got that. We, we've got 200 years of mining history around the city, so we've got plenty of recover mines. Uh, we did a lot of tests in 2012 back to actually look at those. Uh, we've, got a, we've got canals network, we've got a river, we've got sewer, uh, so, and we've got ground source as well. If we don't go deep geothermal ground source, so the heat pump will be interesting. Commercially, currently, the electricity is quite expensive and prohibitive, but if the COP uh, increase and the electricity price decrease, uh, certainly uh, electrification is quite interesting. And then you've got green gas as well in terms of how can we create methane from, from waste, uh, organ, organic waste. Uh, hydrogen, you know, we've got all different flavor and colors, you know, green, blue, pink, uh, uh, green uh, being electrolysis of water. So it's actually, if it's used with renewable energy, uh, therefore you, you don't have any carbon production at all. Uh, blue is when you reform methane and suddenly you need to have a lot of processes uh, through steam reformation. And because it's methane, you still end up with CO2 too, and the CO2 needs to be captured to make sure it's blue. If it's uh, not captured and released the atmosphere, we call that brown hydrogen. Uh, and the pink one, which is an interesting one, is the one which is created through electricity from nuclear uh, and things. But well, what this is my last slide. What I'm saying is the first thing is to put the infrastructures, you know, the hard work I've shown you in terms of it's not really great to dig the roads for the citizens and the businesses to get everybody in uh, queuing because of all these roadworks. But when we've got that, we've got the backbone infrastructures, which is really easy to, uh, over time, change to a, a green system. You've seen one of the slides from Peter where he showed that in the course of, I think, 50 years around Sweden, they went from oil all the way to, I think, is about 90% renewable energy. And, 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 and that's where we need to, to hopefully emulate in, in stock and do that. So that's the end of my presentation, Peter. So I'll give you the floor back. Thanks a lot, uh, Sebastian, for that presentation. Um... You're going to come back a bit later in the session to highlight also the procurement platform. But one of the uh, strengths you have in Stoke on Trent and in Staffordshire with, with this network is that you have developed the plans for a large network in the, the city. And you've started to install part of it, but the plan has, is already in place. And that is the key thing to have the networks, the pipes in the ground. Without that, we can forget about deep geothermal or mine heat and so on. It's just words. And so I think you have done a great job in, in getting this done. In uh, it, it, It's difficult, it's challenging, but you have done a great job in getting it in, in place. Uh, and, but I'll, I'll bring you into this session. Thanks a lot, Sebastian, for that. Uh, one of the purposes, as I said initially in this session, is to highlight technologies and solutions that are now emerging in our sector. Uh, because that will be interesting for the local supply chain and it will create new local suppliers. Um, we had we heard Carl earlier uh, in the session coming from the oil and gas sector. And again, it's quite interesting. We see so many people coming from other industry sectors attracted to this issue of decarbonizing heating. Again, that proves that we are onto something. 
Uh, we're going to now go through three other uh, companies and three presenters also coming from outside of our sector. They have been in the sector for a few years only, but coming in with different perspectives and most importantly, new solutions, which can help us speed up the development uh, of these uh, and implementation of these solutions. So first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Komsov and Kurt Marlein from Belgium. Peter, good afternoon. Welcome to the session, and it's uh, interesting. You. you come from another sector, the fiber optics uh, installation. Exactly. And, and uh, you saw the opportunities. We, well, this, these skills we have here, we can also apply in district heating, and I leave the floor to you. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining. Let me share the screen here. All right. Um, OK, so thank you very much. Um, as Peter said, I'm uh, Kurt Marlijn from uh, Comsof. We are um, a Belgium based company and indeed we have a history in the telecommunications. Uh, we have developed an, uh, a software planning tool for the design of optical fiber networks a long time ago. And about three years ago, we started looking into an, uh, a similar product for planning. Uh, district heating networks. Uh, we could base our software on the same framework. As you can see, there is a very strong uh, link with GIS and, and um, a, a GIS uh, plugin has been made for uh, two tools currently for QGIS and for RGS Pro. Um, we have recently released a new version of our software in June and uh, this includes as well now uh, district cooling, combined heating and cooling as well as uh, thermal storage. So if we look um, to the project development stages of um, a district heating and cooling network, you typically have uh, four stages. This is taken from the, the base brochure in the UK. Uh, you have heat mapping and master planning, uh, followed by a, a feasibility study where you analyze uh, the technical design and the financial modeling. Then you go into detail project, detail project development, and finally, of course, you have construction and commercialization. So with our software, you can uh, focus on the first two parts and, and analyze and study different scenarios in, in um, a feasibility study, looking at uh, different um, yeah, possible options to design your network in a, class, in a quite uh, fast manner. Um, this is because it's um, a tool with uh, a yeah, high level of automation. It, the, um, what the tool is actually doing, it will start from um, uh, a map with the district under consideration, where you have your source, where you have your, uh, your building locations, and the tool will automatically interconnect the, the source or the multiple sources with the buildings in the area. So for that, you will need to provide, of course, uh, GS input data. Uh, besides of the routing, of course, we will uh, dimension the, the network according to um, yeah, the power that is required in every building. So you need energy input data for the buildings in uh, your area. You need technical design parameters, eh? for example, maximum flow allowed, maximum pressure drop allowed, type of pipes you want to use, plastic, steel, twin pipes, double pipes, all combinations are possible. Um, what we also do is calculating the uh, deployment cost for the network. So you need to provide the uh, unit cost of pipe systems, uh, heat exchangers, uh, substations, etc. Plus you can as well calculate the um, investment analysis. So for example, parameters like net present value, um, internal rate of return, uh, payback time can be calculated as well. So for these outputs, you need an additional numbers of, of input parameters like uh, the heat tariff for the for the heat, for example, you want to sell along with some other um, financial parameters that will determine then the uh, viability of your project over the lifetime. So then indeed what we generate is a uh, network topology. I said this is a fully automated design. That, that's what brings uh, the speed in, in the network design because uh, it's very scalable. People, uh, customers are using it for small networks, let's say for 30 connections up to even yeah, 30,000, 40,000 and more for bigger networks. So the network dimensions will be calculated, capex will be calculated and the investment analysis will be looked at. 
Um, here two examples uh, from two major cities in the Netherlands, city of Rotterdam, city of Amsterdam. They are using our software for master planning uh, to look how they can, let's say, uh, go through the energy transition, uh, stop using natural gas, move away from that and, and move to uh, alternatives. And one of the alternatives, of course, would be uh, district heating. So in Rotterdam, they're looking into an area of more than 100,000 homes. In uh, Amsterdam, it's a, a big part of the city with more than 200,000 homes for which they're using our software to analyze yeah, how they could build that plan for the next uh, years and probably even decades until they finish it in, in 2050, I believe. This is an example from uh, the UK, Chelmsford City uh, at a smaller scale. Um, here we did, an, uh, let's say, a, a small pilot project for the city centre and uh, we, we tried to do it very concise in, in um, let's say, a limited amount of time. So actually we had uh, four meetings, as you see there, uh, first to define the ambition, then we had a data review and gap identification, then we did some first scenarios and then at the last meeting we had uh, an output ready. So we made the designs for them based on their inputs. And um, so that's a, yeah, a, a smaller city, of course, compared to Amsterdam, Rotterdam. But as you can see, uh, they have been able to quickly establish and estimate the capex for what it would mean to get a uh, district heating network into their city. If you want to know more about this uh, project, you can find an, um, a white paper on our website, comsoft.com, as well on the website, heatvision2030.com. This is another example from uh, the UK, Glasgow city centre, where we made um, a design based on uh, a river, uh, river source heat pumps. So bigger, big river source heat pumps have been installed next to the River Clyde. In this design, of course, it's not realized yet, of course, uh, we were looking at um, four pumps of about 10 megawatts for each of the four clusters you can see there. And uh, the software allows as well to phase the rollout. So you see, we have identified a number of phases starting in 2022, ending in 2027. And that is taken into account in the investment analysis. And that will give you as well the, um, the investments you have to do over these years, the works to be done over the years, materials to buy in that period, year by year, so that, that you can see how this will um, evolve in, in uh, yeah, the deployment phase. Um, the software gives you as well an um, insight in the financials, as I mentioned. So this is uh, one of the outputs. You're getting an, uh, an Excel file with full details um, of uh, yeah, the, the bill of materials. So first of all, you get the summary and the breakdown of the different components. But then as well, what you're getting is uh, additional details such as uh, the pipe diameter and their length, um, the quantity of expansion loops required, the number of T joints and the different types other joints need to interconnect, for example, uh, yeah, steel pipes of, of 9 meter, 12 meter, you need those joints so you can exactly count how many of these you need and um, attach a cost to these. Customer equipment, heat exchangers, energy meters, substations, distribution substations and additional source costs. So all these components can be taken into account in the, in the CAPEX uh, model that we uh, generate. Um, here's an example of an uh, investment analysis um, calculation as well for the city of Glasgow that we did as, a, as an example. Um, we calculated here yeah, eight different scenarios with different costs for heat as well as with different costs of um, um, energy cost for the main source. Um, what I want to show with this slide is uh, the ease of generating multiple scenarios. As you can see here, more than 50 different design schemes have been calculated. This was a network in uh, Montana based on a geothermal source um, interconnecting a, a town with about 1400 family homes. And as you can see, each design run takes about yeah, two to five minutes. So it's really fast. Uh, once you have made your first design, you can go back on your steps make changes at the input, um, change technical parameters, change cost parameters, um, anything can be changed and you can quickly have an, uh, a new run. Also from this project, you can find a, a white paper on our website. Um, 
We support multiple sources in the network. On the transport network, you can connect uh, multiple sources. If you have too much sources, there are ways to select, let's say, in between those sources based on a number of uh, criteria. Not going to go in details here. Um, recently, in our uh, new version that we uh, launched in uh, June, uh, we have now the possibility to dimension centralized storage based on daily or seasonal variation. So we can place a uh, thermal storage next to the source to reduce the peak. If from 10 megawatts, we can reduce to 9, 8, 7, depending on uh, the capacity of the storage. Besides of centralized storage, we also offer the possibility for distributed storage. So um, again, same network, um, but instead of uh, placing now the storage next to the, the source, we place storage next to the distribution substation. So this will reduce the, the diameter of the transport pipes and it will give us as well um, yeah, increased capacity in, um, in the clusters or will allow us, of course, to, to reduce the, the peak power in those clusters by having those sources present there. So now with the new version, we can dimension these uh, thermal storage tanks based on uh, yeah, load profiles and supply profiles. We also introduced now uh, district cooling. Uh, previously, until yeah, before June, we only supported district heating, but now we can also run uh, simulations for district cooling networks. And we support as well um, combined uh, heating and cooling networks based on uh, heat pumps. And summer you can use it for cooling, and the winter you can use it for heating. Um, and we combine it in that case with uh, a heat pump in the end user location. Uh, because yeah, we're working here with ambient temperature networks, well, not ambient, but uh, low temperature networks, uh, about 15 degrees from a river or another source at 15 degrees. So we're combining this with the heat pump then in the buildings. And our software will then, uh, based on the COP that you enter uh, for the different uh, yeah, type of heat pumps you would like to use, we can calculate then the, um, the heat which is still required from the network and we can also calculate then the electrical power that will be required from the electrical grids as well. Um, we work together with a few other software companies. Um, for example, uh, yeah, Hub for Hydraulic Modeling, one company we work with is Fluid IT, Asset Management, KDH. At the input, we have a few vendors that can supply uh, GS input data as well. And we are there in the beginning, but we would like to be an open platform and we can integrate, let's say, with many different uh, software vendors that can be combined in, in a, a total solution. <clears throat> Here are a few references. Currently, most of our customers are in the Netherlands. We have some in UK, some in Germany. And uh, yeah, we're trying to expand, of course, um, as well yeah, inside Europe and also outside Europe, if possible. Um, thanks to Peter. And I would like to end here, Peter, unless you give me some more minutes, um, but I see my 10 minutes are over. Thanks a lot, uh, Kurt, and thanks for this uh, brief presentation. And it's a great example of a company, a solution coming from another industry sector and being applied in district heating. And this will create enormous advantages, these, these solutions. Uh, for UK and other markets now building district heating because you can do it in a much more cost efficient way. Uh, lots to say about your solutions, Kurt. We're going to come back to that after the holidays, but thanks for joining us today. Another company joining us today is uh, Sofik, a, a company from, from Finland, uh, created by a group of uh, professionals from Nokia, uh, obviously them bringing in uh technology for communication uh, but you're not working on connecting people anymore you're connecting things aren't you Timo? uh thank you peter yes indeed that's our our aim to to do to do that and um and um hello all so so my name is uh is timo Randico and um i'm uh, participating from finland i'm going to talk about district heating a bit even though it's um i wouldn't like to do it it's uh it's still plus 28 here in Finland for some reason. So, um, so cooling is, is more, more in my, my agenda at the moment. But uh, let me say, uh, Peter, I'm sharing my presentation. So tell me once you can, uh, once you can see it. Yeah, 
it's visible now. Okay, okay. So you could, uh, um, potentially enlarge it. That could be helpful. Yeah, I will. I will enlarge it yeah, here, good. so you right. can you can now see it. So, so the the uh, very shortly about our company. So, uh, so having a strong telecom background from Nokia mobile phones uh, brought us to uh, uh, um, do the energy sector to to utilize our know-how in the in the in the wireless uh, wireless technologies. And as Peter said. Uh, uh, how to how to get um, important measurements, uh, important data uh, uh, from the from the end to end energy system to the to the uh, uh, production sites and and to the softwares that can optimize um, optimize the overall energy system. So that's what we do, and uh, and uh, we've been uh, actually in the in the district heating area now the markets for a bit around about three years and in. In Finland, we've been uh, we've been uh, doing well and uh, having having good demand and uh, and and learning a lot as well of this new sector, how to utilize wireless technologies and uh, and then on top of that, so uh, being uh, 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 some months uh, 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 in uh, beyond Finnish borders, we be uh, having now some uh, pilots in Sweden, and uh, there were quite a few talks about Stockholm exercise. So. Actually, we are we are there as well to to help them out to, to optimize uh, uh, district cooling. Here are some of our customers. Um, here is the the overall uh, picture of of our offering today. And uh, as as uh, as has been discussed uh, uh, during today, I think there are quite a few reasons given that. Um, uh, uh, how, why to make district heating smarter and, and how to do it. And I think the common thing uh, um, uh, among the, big, uh, the speakers has been that we need more, more good, good information, uh, uh, high quality data in order to, to, to make, make smart decisions, save energy, uh, 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 reduce the carbon emissions and uh, and, uh, and 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 these sort of things. Uh, and today, um, so so today, I'm going to focus more uh, more in the in the network side. That what uh, what can we do uh, underground? However, we have data available, wireless data available from uh, from the buildings as well. And uh, because we believe that um, it's the end to end that you have to handle in order to. Uh, optimize the, the overall energy energy system and um, uh, 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 and, and that way uh, uh, make this uh, district heating and cooling more more competitive a uh, couple of um, examples so uh, so what, and where we also started obviously in Finland the networks are district heating networks are are all built since 1950s but uh, Unfortunately, this is something that we we start to see more and more. So, so kind of sudden sudden problems, cases, even explosions, and um, and and these kind of things are very expensive to to fix. And uh, I think the thing there is that uh, it's the it's the maintenance that uh, that and uh, uh, which hasn't been sufficient because you cannot do manually. And and the other thing is that uh, uh, if you if you think about the think about the way how these underground uh, network paths have been uh, uh, maintained and and checked has been has been really manual. And uh, and uh, what we are bringing on board is is to digitalize. So instead of putting a putting a a, a technician underground. Uh, and taking a risk every time they go underneath, as as many people say, this is we are playing with uh, warm water and and steam and stuff. So instead of putting a man there, we can we can put their cost efficient technology to do the same stuff and actually do it it all the time, and not only once or twice a year. And uh, and the the benefits there are 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 multiple, and uh, and it's it's about um, it's a. Uh, it's about the um, the uh, 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 lifetime of the of the system, as mentioned. This is one of these things that you make sure that they are they are in good shape. They are not underwater. Uh, 
uh, uh, one one major thing to to make the lifetime more uh, uh, more uh, more longer, and um, and then uh, uh, the safety of the of the maintenance stuff, especially once you are having all the networks, it's it's really the key, and then the the sort of uh, leakage and and energy efficiency. So there are several benefits why to digitalize uh, uh, the the district heating networks and uh, and and couple of uh, things that, that the, the new technology is cost cost efficient so you can uh, uh, pay back this kind of investments uh, very fast uh, with uh, faster than than one year in this particular case um, uh, the second thing is uh, is what what we have uh, brought to to the picture and uh, is is more related to the to the uh, uh, efficiency system efficiency. So, so in in Finland uh, um, there are of course it, it depends on the on the uh, uh, energy company. But uh, the case many times is that for example these uh, basic parameters like um, like pressure and temperature it's only measured in a few places in the network. So so more or less this means that. Um, that uh, well, I'm not saying that they are driving this, uh, for example, production plants and these parameters based on uh, based on experience only. They have some data, as said, but uh, but the new way to optimize it is to is to really uh, 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 multiply the, the the measurement points and get more uh, 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 parameters and and this sort of information from the from the network, from the critical parts. And uh, by doing uh, that, uh, uh, you, can, uh, you can definitely save uh, energy, save money and, uh, and, uh, and, and reduce the emissions. And uh, only by, by talking about these two basic parameters, uh, 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 um, there is this overall uh, uh, expectations that it's somewhere like, uh, Five to up to fifteen percent the savings. I'm saying here ten percent to to be somewhere in the in the in the middle. But for example, in this particular case, uh, uh, it's a rather new installation. But we start to see a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, 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 surprises to the energy companies. That how come the parameters, for example, over here are such that they didn't know. And the simple reason is that because there was no no information, and uh, and now with the wireless technology we can offer that. Um, on top of that, uh, uh, so far the technologies in the in the distributed networks have all about they've been all about more or less like uh, leakage detection. So, so the same parameters like pressure once you measure it frequently enough, and um, having enough measurement points uh, by by adding AI. Uh, uh, you can you can uh, uh, start to detect major leakages, and the more data you have, the more precise you can find even leakages uh, with um, with sort of wireless technologies. And uh, and uh, one of these things that what the digitalization means is that uh, a, a picture that um, that uh, if you if you wanted to get more data out of the network, yes, you can do it in the sort of industrial way as well if you are using this uh, these uh, uh, digging machines and uh, applying all the approvals to get the electricity and blocking the traffic and everything you can do this stuff but uh, like some finished numbers so the estimate is that if you want to make one one measurement point it's about 10 to 30000 euros compared to this kind of um, uh, uh, wireless solutions so we are looking at 1000 euros per measurement point so it makes it makes a big difference and then if you think about the return on investment so these kind of investments are are normally paying themselves back in a, in, a, in a less than a year sometimes in a, in a month so um, makes a makes a big difference uh, uh, how to how to how to get data in the in the efficient uh, in the efficient way and uh, and um, so uh, what I wanted to tell you today in this um, in this short time is that uh, we got a, based on these good presentations we got a lot of reasons why we need to do these things. For example, Sebastian mentioned that without doing anything but just getting data from uh, from the existing building, there are a lot of uh, benefits. 
and uh, but but then uh, 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 in a longer term you can combine those kind of data like sensor data to 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 any other system uh, to uh, to to furthermore uh, get get more value out of the data and 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 save uh, save energy so so what we supply all together is is uh, is is this kind of uh, wireless sensor technologies but then we have this uh, um, an overall um, industrial platform, IoT platform that we can really collect the data, monitor that the, the sensors work well, so we can offer high quality data. And then we discuss with the energy companies that uh, where do they need to get the data, and uh, and we provide it, and, uh, and 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 then we then we start to have a smart smart systems in place. And uh, and one additional thing, what I what I mentioned, what is coming underground as well is is our ADM flow. So uh, uh, this is the only thing still missing, critical data, what has been asked by our customers. And now we are we are proud to brought the, the new technology into markets uh, second half of this year. And and then we have a, a complete uh, parameter portfolio uh, fully wirelessly to um, to energy energy companies underground. Uh, thank you very much uh, for for listening and uh, and uh, if if any further questions about how to use utilize uh, wireless technologies or or ideas how to how to make them even smarter so I'm more than willing to to have um, to have further discussions but uh, thank you thank you Peter and back to you thanks thanks a lot Timo and here we have an, another example of a new entrant to our sector looking to grow uh, not only in Finland you are growing across Europe now and also beyond uh, but where there is an opportunity and we have discussed this with the Chamber in uh, Commerce in the Staffordshire to see how we can link you up with local companies in the region to establish the necessary local collaboration you need and we're going to come back on that Another company, uh, not digital, but uh, equally advanced and interesting is uh, Carboseal, formerly known as PPR. Uh, Andreas, thanks for joining us and sharing what you do. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to join in. And um, so I'm going to try to stay very brief, but um, I'm going to talk on the subject that was mentioned um, quite extensively earlier by Sebastian. Um, namely the issues of of uh, planning and and digging trenches and handling trenches and everything that it um, that it has an impact on traffic businesses on top of ground etc uh, we're not really there yet to build new power pipes without without a trench uh, but at least we have a solution to refurbish pipes that is already in the ground and make them new so um, what what we have is a solution to uh, to reline district heating pipes and make them new. So instead of uh, having a lot of interference uh, in in the city or in the streets, uh, we would just simply have one exit point to one entrance point and that's it. The rest can continue as as usual. So as you see on the picture to the left, traffic is flowing easily and everything else is going on as as normal. Whereas in the right picture, there is a, a big impact on on the streets. There is also a lot of other networks in the ground to take care of and all the the work prior to this to apply for permits to dig, um, re-planning traffic, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is is all avoided. So basically, what we have is a very simple, fast, and sustainable solution to renew your district heating networks. Again, um, it's all about simplicity and reducing anything from from the workload, from the time it takes. Um, to the carbon footprint as well. It's much better if you can replace your pipes by utilizing what's already in the ground. It would save roughly 80% of the carbon footprint. Here is uh, one example uh, 
from Denmark, where we replaced a uh, 170 meter long pipe of DN200 size across this bridge. Um, so the pipe was replaced in, in less than a week compared to having to shut off the bridge and trying to dig it up and replace it, which would likely have taken months. Here is another example where we replaced uh, or we actually downsized from a DN400 to a DN300 underneath this road where, where they had a leak. Uh, so we renewed the pipe and then it will be in service for another 20, 30, 40 years at least. Uh, quickly how we do it. As I said, we need an entrance point and an exit point, uh, two small trenches or pits or even through existing manholes if there are available manholes. We would open the pipe, um, half of it, so it doesn't need to be fully cut. And once it is opened, we would clean it by high pressure water or different types of polypigs or scrapers and things like that if, if needed or as needed. Do a quick video inspection to make sure it looks good and is in, uh, in, in decent fit. Um, for us to start the installation. We would winch in the liner, so the liner is a winched in version. And uh, when the liner is winched in, we would start the steam unit, which would inflate the liner, press it towards the uh, host pipe and start curing. And then after seven, eight hours, uh, we would stop the curing process. We would go into the entrance and exit holes and do a small cut uh, to make the, the starting point and the ending point of the liner looking nice and then install a seal to connect the liner to the host pipe. All this is done in yeah, roughly one long workday. So you have very little interference on the network over time. Brief summary of the product. Um, obviously, it has been designed for the harsh environment in the district heating networks. Um, and we could uh, we could do it today DN125 to DN450. Um, with some additional time, we could go up to DN800. Uh, we test the system and totally freestanding as you can see in the picture to the right. So the liner itself freestanding can bear the loads of, of the pipe. So even if the host pipe would fully corrode and there is no host pipe there anymore, you could still run the system as it was when it was installed new. That was a uh, quick version. And please don't hesitate to get in touch if we could help in in renewing your pipes or prolonging the lives of them, um, regardless of, of where they are. Thanks a lot, Andreas. And this is obviously a solution that is uh, ideal or, or very much in demand in the Nordic region, where we have had pipes in the ground for decades. But you're also seeing business evolving in the UK. There are there are not there are heat networks in place in the UK which needs this. Uh, in university. Yeah, we've already had a few requests already, and we have a local, we have some local uh, people on the ground that that could come out and take a look at existing networks and see where it is feasible to install and and how to do it. And we have also installation companies locally that that are able to do this. So, yeah, obviously, as you say, it's it's ma mainly for for where there are old networks in place and I didn't think of, of, of the UK market as the biggest market from the start but we've had a lot of interest already from the UK market and we've also been in contact with some other industries where where they are putting liners or are, or wanting to put liners almost from the start of installation as a security as an extra security to to make the the lifetime longer of the pipes or to simply make the pipe more secure for chemical plant or other industrial plants, for example. Oh, it's interesting. And uh, also, I've been in the district 
pipeline business for many years, and sometimes sometimes things go wrong also with new new newly installed networks where you need to replace a small section. And here, this is an opportunity, obviously, to use your solution as well. There was a brief question, a question we should address briefly in the chat. Can you use this for water pipe networks as well? Uh, we have not qualified for drinking water. Uh, this would be, there are other solutions for drinking water. Um, we have not investigated that market really. Our focus has always been the high temperature and the high pressures in district heating networks, as there is no solution available on the global market for this. Uh, but if if you have a need for, for the water pipes, if you cannot find info of, of solutions for it, just get in touch and I can maybe point you in the right directions for that. Super. Thanks a lot for joining us, Andreas. And uh, there will be lots of things uh, to be procured for councils going forward uh, to do these installations. Uh, and Sebastian, you have taken an initiative in this field to uh, simplify procurement uh, uh, of technologies to these kind of solutions. Yes, Peter, I'm conscious of time, so I'll try to go quickly for my presentation. Uh, looking, sharing my screen, right. So hopefully you can see my presentation. Yeah. Right. So yes, we've got a procurement framework uh, facility in in the council here in Stockholm, trying to call Stock Depot, um, and basically there's a strong market as you as you all know. Uh, currently the penetration on the market for DHN in the UK is about 2% of the total heat use. Uh, the government wants to raise that to 20% by 2030. Uh, that's a massive undertaking with a lot of things to be done. And we're basically looking currently at about one point, almost seven billion pounds in the next uh, in the next five years on investment. So there's a lot of things to be procured uh, on the market to do this. And typically, uh, local authorities or uh, public bodies has to go through a procurement uh, exercise due to uh, regulation, and, and 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 quite often they they varies in time. Between between three to six months. Uh, and this is time when they need to basically create a brief, uh, publish it, get people to tender for those and so on. Um, and quite often, every time you need to procure something, you have to go through this process. But if you got existing framework, you can actually directly appoint or you can run mini competition in a much more convenient time frame, probably about two to three weeks, uh, possibly a week if you directly appoint. So what we wanted to do in, in, in Stoke basically was to create a framework for anything related to decentralized energy to be available as well for any other local authorities, NHS bodies and, and um, also further education bodies. Uh, in the UK, so that's Scotland, uh, Wales, and North Ireland, and England. Um, and currently, what we've got is two frameworks. Uh, the first one is about technical and professional consultancy support, where it's all about, as you can see, energy mapping and, and techno-economic feasibility studies, energy master planning, but also surveying plant room, uh, doing details, electric, and also uh, civil works to do some uh, underground pre, uh, pre work uh, verification and surveys, uh, and also to uh, do contract management with uh, Berry Network civil uh, contractors, and also to do management uh, project uh, around that. And the second framework is about uh, pipe and, and, and any equipment alongside the network, such as uh, alarm wires and also um, uh, valves and so on. So we got these two going on as we speak. Uh, they've been going on for two years and they get there for another two years. Uh, and anybody can use those. Uh, but what we want to do in the future is looking at what the market wants. And the market is a big word. It's one hand the supplier uh, and the other hand the customer and trying to marry that. And we've got John Carr as well today on, on, on the on the call, um, which has been appointed to try to help us uh, in terms of growing the offers from Stock Depot. And, and I don't know if you can come on, 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 on the call, John, and maybe provide some information on why you're trying to do in the next uh, few weeks uh, okay. and how people can help you to, to do that. Um, thanks, Sebastian. We're very quick notice for all the time. Um, um, I haven't got a presentation, so this is 
me talking on what Sebastian's just put across, and also picking up on a number of the points, which I've made some I did make uh, quite a few notes on what people have been saying from the uh, the customers and the clients and uh, that side of it. And what I'm what I'm doing is I'm actually on the, the framework on lot two. And um, what, what I am doing though is working with the authority on on how Stoke Depot can be developed, um, what future framework um, envelopes need to be considered. And um, while I feel I'm uh, working on this place is because some other aspects of activity I'm underway in other parts of the UK is um, is actually, I, I, I act for other regions working up their decarbonisation strategies. So I just pick up on one big piece of work that I've just finished, and it's a note for everybody's diary, is as of next week, um, the northwest region of the UK is formally launching through Bayes its decarbonisation strategy of how to get to zero by 2040. Um, and people today have been talking about the potential of the market. Well, the market that I've been involved in defining is absolutely atmospherically large. It's, it's, it's the growth potential for businesses such as Comsoft and Softcore and, and others is absolutely huge. So um, what I'm trying to go with this is, is that I'm supporting Stoke on how its network Stoke Depot can, can develop, but the networking ability of the business to business opportunities is, uh, is staggering. Um, we need at Stoke um, a framework set up that hopefully can help other local authorities around the UK to sort of grow their need, which is coming for district heat networks. Just to make one or two references to the Northwest region alone is in that scoping work, which is now with central government, is we've outlined around 700 district heat networks just for the Northwest region. That's 700. They're about a third the sizing of a Stoke network. But this is a 10 billion pound investment over the next 10 to 15 years. And um, one, local authorities need assistance to how to do this. And two, the business opportunities for um, the likes of the companies that have been on this call today is, is how to get an access to that market. Um, so this supplier engagement that uh, uh, Peter's doing, and I've been working with Peter on this for about the last five years, is 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 this avenues to market how to work with local authorities and the stoke depot type framework system is just right in the right spot now to how that's going to be developed to cover other aspects of the heat network uh, development and how they roll them out i'm thinking bang on time there peter thanks a lot uh, john and sebastian yeah we are short on time and definitely we shouldn't run over for too long tonight because you have a good I guess an important game coming up tonight. Uh, you're going to watch it, all of you, and me, including myself. Uh, Scott, I know you were, you're with us. If we could just invite you to the conversation uh, a minute or two. I believe you are, or you might have left us. Yeah, do you have? Anyway, oh, well, I can cover Scott in the sense of yeah, that, that yeah, please. I, I mean, we we see uh, yeah. with investments taking place in Stoke, and we are called, and and um, the I know opportunities created for, yeah. for companies. How 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 can well, they? I, come I, I, I sit on both sides of the fence. Essentially, I'm 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 I do work with lots of businesses in my area and other regional areas. So the chamber and I, and I work with Scott is the chamber is so keen now to mobilize the the local it isn't just stoke staffordshire regional supply chain for for businesses who at the moment most are a little bit under the radar have known what the scale of the opportunity is and these will be ideal for partnerships and to work in this area with with companies coming from scandinavia because to be blunt is the market for the uk is that we're painting is 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 too big if you see what I mean, there's so it, it's just it's just staggering the level of skills, training, business diversification opportunities there are. And the chamber in now in our area is getting a, its head round that scale and, and wants to mobilize the local uh, business communities to, to get involved. Super. Thanks for that, John. And uh, again, to everybody who's still in the session, uh, we're going to come back to you with further similar activities, perhaps more deep dive sessions after the holidays. 
But uh, Laura, is there anything you want to say before we conclude? I don't think Laura can hear me now. Anyway, I suggest we conclude the session now and wish you. All right, there you are, Laura. Sorry, apologies. No My worries. My is a bit slow, so sorry about that. Um, so apologies. Um, fantastic session today. I know we had a lot of engaging conversation and I know there's been a lot of engaging chat as well, which is great to see. Um, just wanted to say um, a big thank you from Peter. And that of course, this recording will go to everybody that's been part of the meeting today. And of course, what we'll do is if Peter's OK with that, is we'll send a recording of the meeting before this as well. Um, we are passionate about this in Stoke, absolutely passionate. And I'm sorry to say that Sarah was on holiday um, this week and she would have been delighted to join us um because she's very very passionate um about making sure um this happens in in staffordshire and we're we're doing everything that we can and um, to put this in place so i just wanted to thank everybody for being here are there any questions or anything that anybody wants to say before we end the session today All no, quiet. Have covered it. That, that's not a bad thing or everybody wants to go home and watch the football not entirely sure which one it is um fantastic um lovely to see everybody um and like i said we will pass on the recordings to both of them thank you again to peter and um, for all the work you've done hard work on on both of these events it's been absolutely fantastic it's been a pleasure to be a part of it so uh, thank you very much thanks for a great collaboration with you laura and the team and uh, wish you all good luck tonight for the game thanks Fantastic. Bye, everyone. Take care now. Cheers. Uh, John, are, are yeah. you, can we connect separate uh, after? Uh, you can, can hang on. A, you send me a link or we can either hang on.